So Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 21. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap a stumbling block, and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. The word of the Lord. So this is a section of scripture where Paul is, as of course he's writing to this church in Rome, um, he's talking about election, he's talking about um, people who are chosen, people who have um, not been elect, people who have... Um, been turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, and, and even here, people who um, are given eyes by which they will not see, and eyes by which they, they cannot see, and ears which they cannot hear. So there is a, a divine retribution that's actually happening. The justice of God is being given to God's chosen people from the Old Testament, the church in the Old Testament, to Israel. And this is one of those hard passages, and um, actually preparing for it, it's like, okay, this is going to be fun to preach. Uh, and so I'm like, what do, you, what do you say about this? And I think I have something. I think the Lord, obviously, is in the word of the Lord, so it's something meant for us. And one thing is, I think, it, you know, in a lot of churches, and it doesn't matter what denomination, if, if the style of preaching is, um, let me find a topic to find and preach on, um, which I did for years, and thank God I don't do that anymore. It's just take, you know, I remember walking off, off of the pulpit and thinking, what am I going to preach next week? And just spending half a week figuring out what text am I going to use. And so it's, it is very helpful to be able to go, well, I know next week it's the next verse. We're just going to keep going through it. And so you study it and you see what it is, and whatever it is is, is what we have. And that's what all of the Scripture is profitable for pre preaching and teaching and Training in righteousness, as is, as is this. But this gets passed over a lot in topical preaching because this is not one of those go-to passages where you're just like, hey, let me give you guys a, a message for today about why we need to be more nice to each other, something like that. This is, this is what is it? What is this about? And I think it's about the character of God. And I think Paul definitely wants us to be aware of what's going on because um, you can, sorry, the Pink Floyd lyric comes to my head. That you know what it's like banging your, your heart against some mad bugger's wall. You know, you just can't get through to some people. And then we even see ourselves at times, it's like, goodness, it seems as if even the Holy Spirit has trouble with our hearts sometimes. And we know the Holy Spirit blows where he will. God is far more powerful than, than we ourselves are. And yet, people who, as ourselves, have given ourselves over to God because we know God has called us, God has chosen us, God has brought us into his presence by the blood of Christ, and we look at ourselves and we think to ourselves, goodness. You know, it's, it's Jesus is at the table and says, one of you is going gonna, is gonna to betray me. And they all kind of look and it's going, is it, is it I? Is it I? And then when we read these passages, as we sang this morning, Psalm 95, you know, don't be like your fathers who harden themselves in the wilderness. Don't be like them. And so we have to look at ourselves and go, is it, is, it, is it I? You know, am I doing this? Am I, do I have a true faith? How do I know? And then if you look at Israel, it's like, look at everything Israel had. And what's going on there? 
And then, you know, we've had centuries to debate and talk about this in the church. But early on, you're like, oh, wait a second. This is, this is the church. This is, you know, the, the Jews are rejecting this, I mean, almost wholesale. You know, if they aren't believing this, why should we believe this? And so Paul's, you know, it's not the first time he's bringing this up. He's been talking about this in, in um, 9 and 10. And it's almost like, okay, you're continuing to hit this point. And I really believe that, that what's happening is a couple of things. One is, um, Jonathan Edwards, you know, preaches, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And in my Facebook feed, there's another sermon series that somebody's doing. It's called Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. And it's like, okay, they're doing a little play off of this. And, um, and, and of course, as a pastor, I know better than to preach a, a, a brimstone and hellfire sermon because, you know, that's what those evil bad churches do that just don't do anything but what preach the glad verses you know that's just what are we supposed to do I want to make you feel good I want you to leave from here encouraged I don't want you going home going you know screaming and crying I don't know if I'm saved I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven or not and yet maybe that's what some of us need you need to think about it you know am I truly saved surely God would not reject his people well you better make sure you're his people just because you have the name Israelite didn't make you an Israelite. And that's what he's already said this. All of Israel is not Israel, but the chosen. There's a remnant now he's talking about. And you have to really, as you, as you think about this and you look at this, you wonder, again, you know, why? I almost felt like at this point, he's like, you made your point. Let, let's move on. But he obviously has not made his point yet. And I think um, particularly is just, I remember uh, reading through Philippians, meditating upon Philippians, and he's in prison, and he's just the joy book people call it. You know, it talks about joy so much. It's like, and he's in prison. And, you know, and the message can be, well, if Paul can be imprisoned, and these prisons weren't the nicest of prisons at the time, and, and he can speak of joy, then so much more should we. Um, but I do believe that Paul is preaching to himself in Philippians. That he's saying, this is what I need to hear. I need to know these things. And I'm going to write this to you because you certainly need to know it too. And so you get this from Paul. And so Paul starts this section of scripture with saying, I wish that I could be cut off from my people. It's not that Paul does not have the attitude of, you know what? They're hard-hearted. They're not listening. And even worse, they're, they're being very difficult to me. And he could very easily say, you know what? Curses upon them. They are anathema. God wiped them out. If you know much about Martin Luther's life, you know, toward the end of his life, he was getting so frustrated with them, and he wrote some kind of nasty things about the Jews uh, that was unchristlike. That was not very Pauline. That's one of the areas in which he failed. And that's, that's what men do. We fail from time to time. We sin. And, but think what Paul is doing here is saying, you know, don't think it's something strange when this fiery trial comes upon you. Don't think it's strange when, you know, people who should grow up in the church, people who, you know, they, they've been in this, and then they reject. It's like, be careful with this. And then Paul himself, and so I think it would be good for us to turn to 2 Corinthians, and just at 2 Corinthians 11, so that we can be reminded of Paul's situation and, and what's happening here in 2 Corinthians 11. And we're going to begin in verse 21. Now, there's these people who are coming in and um, they're claiming to be apostles and they're false apostles. And Paul's having to say, you know, they're, they're, they're building themselves up. Look how awesome we are. And one of the things that they're apparently telling the people at the church in Corinth is, look at Paul. Do you think he has God's blessing? You think that, that, I mean, look at him. He's lost everything. Uh, he was, he had it all going for him religiously. I mean, he was, he was, the, compared to, he was in a bad way, the Billy Graham of the time. And he was just like, I'm, I'm rising to the top. Um, they're going to buy all my books. And then, you know, you, he, he trashes all that without Christ. He says, I was on the wrong track. I was trying to establish my own righteousness. And when I found Jesus Christ, I realized I just count all that as worthlessness. And so now I press forward. So these in Corinth are saying, you know, you can tell that somebody has a blessing of God by the blessings they have in their life. And, you know, Job, a righteous man suffering, 
you know, not because of sin, pointing to Christ who would also come and suffer, not due to sin. And then Paul's like, okay, listen. So in verse 21, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-one. 21, to my shame I must say we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman. I mean, he knows he's not supposed to be. It's like, he's like, I can hear the words that are coming out of my mouth, but you got to listen to what I'm saying. Because if you think a servant of Christ looks like them, you're wrong. You need to understand a servant of Christ is going to look like Christ and not like the world. And so he says, I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater money, far more accolades, far more uh, joyous parties being thrown for me, far more, you know, this is not what he's saying. It's, it's, Sproul does this a lot. He'll read and say, that's not what the scripture says at all. You're eating with me? He's like, no, that's not what he's saying. You want me to boast about something? Listen to this. Far greater labors, far more imprisonments with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Because, you know, God forbid they accidentally did one too many, so they'd back, it's like the baker's dozen, make sure you get enough, but they were going to make sure they didn't go too far, so they only would whip him 39 times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, and that means they picked up big old stones that fit your hand pretty good, and they hurled them at him in order to kill him, to crush his skull and cause him to die. That was it. That was what was happening to him. And they even succeeded once, and he got up. Danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles. Danger in the city. Danger in the wilderness. Danger at sea. Danger from false brothers in toil and in hardship. Through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is not weak, and I am not weak. Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall to escape his hands. <laughs> and then he goes on to other things. I mean, this is, this, is, this is Paul, who is now writing, I wish I could be cut off for their sake. And this is the spirit of Christ speaking through him because Jesus himself, as he's being crucified on the cross, says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Stephen being stoned at the hands of the Jews as he's uh, crying out to them with the gospel. And he looks up and sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. And he says, um, do not count the sin against them. Having the spirit of Christ in the times of, of greatest trial to be poured into our hearts in a way where his grace overwhelmingly comes out. And so as we're in chapter 11 of, of Romans, and he's saying, you know, has God rejected his people? It certainly seems like it. And his first thing is, well, wait a second. I'm Jewish. So there's still me. He hasn't rejected me. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? So he's going to the prophets. And he says how Elijah appeals to God against Israel. And you had to think, all right, why is he picking Elijah? Well, there is this passage about the remnant. And he does want to talk about the remnant. But is Paul maybe feeling a connection with Elijah here? Because what's happening with the prophet of God, Elijah, is um, the, the nation is turning away. And you have King um, Ahab and you know, Jezebel, that's, she's definitely opposing him. First Kings 18, 19 is where these things are. Um, and they go out and they slaughter the prophets of God. And, uh, and it's where the response to, to, uh, to, of God through 
Elijah is where he calls out the prophets of Baal. These are Jewish prophets who have rejected God, and they're, they're praying and prophesying of these false gods. And it's like, this is Israel, what's going on? And so he, as the, the prophet is standing out there, he's like, you know, we're going to see, call down fire from heaven, and we'll see which one answers. And then he starts mocking them, you know, where's your God? Maybe he's relieving himself somewhere. You know, where is he? And then suddenly fire comes down and does consume Elijah's sacrifice from Yahweh, and he also consumes all the other prophets. The name gets back to, the word gets back to um, King Ahab. Jezebel finds out about it, and she's just ready to, she says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill him. Um, and then um, Elijah finds out about it, and in this particular point, now he's afraid. What do I do? And so he, he's, he's fleeing, and because his life, and, there's, and he sees what's happened. They've, they've slaughtered God's prophets. But he's seen God at work in retribution, but he knows just because I'm a prophet doesn't mean I'm being spared from this. He understands that I too can be killed. And then here's Paul, a prophet of God now, an apostle of God, and he sees what's happening to him, and he's got to be able to say, man, if it happened to Elijah, and he's like, but, but he uses this. So he says, verse you know, 2, he says, how he, he appeals to God. And he says, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your, offer, your altars. And I alone am left. And they seek my life. And this has to be how Paul has felt from time to time. I mean, especially when he's thinking about his brothers, the Israelites, his fellow Jews. And when he goes to synagogues or he goes to these places, they seek his life to kill him. And finally in Rome, you know, he ends up imprisoned and these terrible things happen. But he says, what was God's reply in verse 4? And God's reply was, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, Baal is a, a it means Lord. It's in this other language. It's just this. I think it's a Canaanite deity. It's this foreign god, a false god that they're worshiping. And they're bowing the knee. All these prophets are bowing the knee to him. Imagine, you know, it's like churches, as we kind of see happening in our day, bowing the knee to other than God. Bowing the knee to the gods of the culture. Bowing the knee to the gods of government. Bowing the knee to the gods of demonically inspired synagogues of Satan. All these sorts of evils that happen in our world today and if we don't see it as demonically inspired evil, then we have to be careful lest we too gradually, gently get turned into bowing our knee to Baal as well. And so you have to be a prophet. A prophet is going to get struck down. You know, if, you, if, if the world is getting darker and you have just a little bit of light, the darker it gets, the brighter that light shines. It doesn't mean you got to make your light brighter. If it keeps getting darker, it just gets to be brighter. And we're called to make our light shine, not to hide it under a bushel. Why in the world would anybody hide a light under a bushel anyway? Because you're scared it's going to be seen. And Paul, one of the brightest lights that's up here now, what's he supposed to do? He's like, what was the answer? Elijah, I got 7,000 men, I'll say, that have not bowed the knee to Baal. 7,000. Now, that's a lot. But comparatively, it's just a, it's a tiny remnant. But that's 7,000, which is more than just you. I'm at work, and you don't see it. And so this is part of what Paul is saying. He is at work in Israel. But there is a judgment that's happening to Israel. If we had time, we'd go back to, to uh, Matthew 24, and he's talking about the judgment that's coming upon this generation, particularly um, in Jesus' day where they've killed the prophets, and they've rejected the Christ, and they've done all these things. And the Bible does tell us that all these things that have happened in the Old Testament to Israel happened for us to see, to learn from. So one of the things we're supposed to learn from from, from this more, the, the recent history at Paul's time when he's writing is, be careful lest you too turn away. You, you have to be careful. You have to cling to your Lord. Don't just think because you're in the church that you're in the church. You have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, get, have an outworking of it. Make sure you see it at work in your life, clinging to the promises of God. And one of the problems that we can begin to have is we are not clinging to the promises. We begin to cling to our own good works. And especially as you see the Holy Spirit begin to work in your life and you start to go, hey, 
you know, you might not say it, hey, I'm doing pretty good, but you start to feel like you're doing better. I mean, if you compare yourself to maybe what you were like, you know, years and years and years ago, you have reason to boast. Look how much better I'm doing. But we're called to be humble, we're called to be penitent, and one of the things that should be happening in the life of a believer is, it's kind of like the emperor's new clothes. You kind of just have to pretend that you're doing better because you start to have this little inward feeling that, you know, I'm not quite as good as I ought to be. But, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing good, I'm doing good. I'm not quite as good as all these other people. And if, if you're the only one that can see the depths of your heart. You can see the depths of your heart better than anybody else. But unfortunately, at times, what the world, the flesh, and Satan will do is blind you to that. So that what you do see about yourself is, I'm clothed in righteousness. But no, you're just like that king walking around naked. And then some little kid finally goes, hey, you don't have any clothes on. And everybody's like, what, what, what? And he goes, you know, it's like you're fooling yourself. Be very careful of this sort of thing, that you're not clinging to your robes of, of personal righteousness. And it's, it's very easy to fall into. Look, and even if it's not your good works, it can be your good beliefs. I believe the right thing. I'm thinking the right thing. My theology is right. So you had to be careful about that. Well, that's fine. You got good theology. It's like we talk about, you know, you got a great chair there. Okay, you know how to build a good chair. Are you resting in it? Are you sitting in it? Is Christ for you? Is all this theology for you? Does this theology lead you to well up with praise on the inside? Does it begin to make you weep for the sin that still clings so closely to you? So that if you're a believer and you're growing in Christ, and you begin to see the sin within, it should cause you to cling more closely to the promises of God. And then say, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this wretched body of death? Why this? Help me do better. Cause me to do better. I want everybody here to sin less. I want to sin less. And how do you do that? You have to be more like Christ. And that hurts. And it's not easy. And you can feel like you're all alone. And what God is saying here, part of this is, there's a remnant. There are times when the world might look like it's like, man, we're, we're pretty much, you know, everybody's Christian here. Then there's times when there's darkness, and it's like, where is everybody? And God's like, I've got this. And so you have to be aware that you may be in a situation like Elijah, and God's still at work. It's not just when you can go out and you've got the best cars, you've got the, everything's going well for you. If you just have more faith, everything go well for you. That's, that's not the testimony of Scripture. That is Satan's gospel that he would have people to believe and cling to even today. I hate it. I think it's awful. I, 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 I'm not sure how to even address it because people cling to it. Just like read the Bible, and these people will read the Bible and still see it. So you have to be careful. Read this. And then what happens next? He says in verse 5, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Now, he's not saying it used to be on the basis of works, but now it's not because now it's by grace. What he's saying is if it's grace, then it, it can't be by works because it's by grace by definition. So are you saved by grace or are you saved by works? And those are two different things. You're either under a covenant of works, under which you are condemned and damned, or you're under a covenant of grace, under which you are covered by the blood of Christ. Now, we're under a covenant of grace. That means God is gracious to us. So would that not work itself out in our lives in such a way that God gives us all the stuff that we want, the desires of our heart? And the Bible says, absolutely. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You want to know him better? Well, what if that means you got a little suffering to go through? Then what we're supposed to say is, bring it on. And what I say is, stop. I want to know you better, but not like that. And that's what Satan tried to give to Christ. I can give you a kingdom without the cross. All you got to do is worship me. That's it. And so it can't be different today. We have the same Savior. We have the same gospel. But the world... Satan would want to come and say, you know, if you're a good believer and you have faith, God's grace is upon you. I mean, Satan's going to preach a great sermon. I mean, it's going to sound right. C.S. Lewis at the beginning, I think it's in the preface to uh, Screwtape Letters, talks about listening to Hitler. And Hitler was a great preacher. 
Oh, man. I remember I had a friend in college, and it was early on. They were doing a lot of, they were discovering a lot of um, these tapes that they have found that was Hitler's and these documentaries that were being made in German and stuff. It was just some, some one of the professors there was like a Nazi hunter, and, the, um, and he was trying to just, anyway, he's doing lots of work with this. And a friend of ours that was a student there was working for him, and he was like, I'm supposed to go through these tapes and see if there's anything interesting in it. So we'd watch these tapes, and everybody's probably seen them. They've been on TV and stuff. But, but Hitler, but, um, he'd get in front of a mirror, and he'd just practice, chin up, looking out. And I, this, this is what I remember. There's tons of stuff in it. But one thing I do remember was, like, he'd start like this is how Hitler would start. Everybody's, well, he'd just stand there. until it was quiet, and it was pin drop. And then he would begin by, it's good to be here today. I see that we're all able to get great Germany's song. Germany's one of the the greatest people in, in the whole world. And one day, we will all rise to greatness, and we will see that we are a people that no one can withstand, and before too long, the whole world will see that we indeed are the ones who are chosen, and we will conquer the world. I mean, it sounds like some preachers talk very softly so that people listening and get them all riled up. Now, it's not, this is not so fun in here, but you know, you got several tens of thousands of people listening. That's powerful. So we had to be careful. There's one beautiful picture of all these people focused on Hitler. And one guy's turned around, and he's just got looking like just disgusted. One guy. It's like a remnant. And we have to be careful of that. And the way you do it is truth. You have to know what is true. And what Lewis said at the beginning of the screw tape letters is, when I listen to Hitler on the radio, it sounded right, and it sounded good, except I knew the truth, and it was a lie. And that's what we have to do. But we're so apt to want to believe our leaders. We want to believe our preachers. We want to believe those who stand up and proclaim the word of God. And you have to be careful, because Satan himself also presents himself as an angel of light and will present there's a book I have, um, Sermons of Satan. It's got Satan sitting there in the pulpit and preaching. I've never read it. it looks, I'm, I probably should, but it's just a very cool title for a book. But it's about liberalism and, and all these things that were, that were happening within the church. But it's by grace that we're saved. And that means you have to humble yourself, recognize your sin, recognize how far short you fall, recognize that you're not as good as you hope to be. You're not as good as you hopefully want to be. But in Christ, and that's where you have to be. Who am I in Christ? Who am I deep down? And you have to hope to see the Holy Spirit work, and that drives you into his word because you see as you, you're interacting with the Holy Spirit in his word and at church and the sacraments that you feel his presence. And it's not all about feeling. It is about, I love what I'm learning about him. I love what I'm understanding about him. I love knowing more about God because I desperately need him and I believe the promises. And then they say in verse 7, what then? Paul writes, Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. And he's talked about this earlier. They were seeking righteousness by the law, but not like it was by faith. They tried to, they tried to uh, obey. They tried to be good on their own power and build themselves up and look how good we are. And so they they failed to obtain grace, so we must be careful that we too do not do that. They failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. As a bowing, and it's either um, probably under a slavery um, or mourning or something like this. And it's like, that's harsh. That's New Testament. That's Old Testament brought into the New Testament. And this is Psalm 69. So if you go to Psalm 69, and this is one of the, the Psalms that the early church 
um, really was clinging to and finding out a lot about the suffering of Christ and their situation of, of God in the world. And so if you think about Paul's situation as he explained in 2 Corinthians, if you think about Elijah's situation, as is, as is being explained in, in, 1 Corinthians, in 1 Kings, and we see that the prophets of God, the people of God, um, are really, you know, they're, they're turning against their own people that are of faith. So you have the majority of those people who are chosen by God is like the, the church, the, the visible kingdom of Israel, not those, those who were circumcised, as the Old Testament says, they were circumcised in the flesh only, and they did not have their heart circumcised. So they had all the externals of religion, but not the Holy Spirit operating in sanctification and cleansing. And this is the operation of the Holy Spirit today. We, we, it's this work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that give us a new heart so that um, we, we, we should begin to hate more and more the flesh stained by sin. And so that we desire these things. But there's a, a suffering that's going on. And this is what he talks about again with, with, with um, David. This is the Psalm of David. And it begins, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire. That's a nasty mud you're sinking into where there's no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary with my crying out. And my throat is parched. I mean, you see it crying. I mean, that's what he's been crying out so much. His throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. So this has been going on a long time. There is a suffering. This is up to my neck. I mean, we've all have to. If you can't say I've ever felt like that, then you're just. You know, so, you know, what more can I deal with? I'm crying out. I can't cry out anymore. I'm at the end. More in verse four. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. Why did I not, what I did not steal, must I now restore? So it's false, you know, they're making these accusations. Oh God, you know my folly, the wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. So he's aware of personal sin and stuff, he knows. But let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me. Oh, Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O God of Israel. Don't let me give up. Don't let me do this. And you've got to think, this is what Paul is saying too. You know, I'm going through a lot. And he's also saying to the church in Rome, you're going to go through a lot. Remember, Rome, they're about to go through some severe persecutions. I mean, there's a, there's a, if you want to read about terrible things happening to people, this is what's happening. And so he's letting them know. You know, read your scriptures, see these things happen. Um, verse 7, for it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. And now you begin to see a little bit of a, a prophecy and a foretelling of the, the king to come, the righteous one, the true Israelite, Jesus Christ, who's going to bear the sins and reproaches of his people. Um, verse 8, I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons, for zeal for your house has consumed me. And Jesus actually quotes this verse. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Which is interesting, the way David is looking at it and the way it actually happens to Christ. Where our, the reproaches actually do fall upon him. In verse 10, when I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I'm the talk of those who sit in the gate and the drunkards make songs about me. So even when he would try to do things of repentance, he would try to do the right things, it just makes it worse. They're going after him. Verse 13, but as for me, my prayer for you, O Lord, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, your chesed, answer me in your saving faithfulness. So he's asking him to the promises that you've made, answer those promises. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. He's feeling this. He's not just like, I'm a poet and I'm feeling bad today. Let me, let me, just, let me just put my black makeup on and write this stuff. So he is at the end, feeling this. This is at the end and he, he can't take it anymore. Answer me, O oh Lord. 
and your steadfast love, for your steadfast love is good according to your abundant mercy. Turn to me. This is how we are to pray to God when we're in these situations. Hide not your face from your servant. May your face shine upon me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Come, come quickly, Lord. Draw near to my soul. Redeem me. Ransom me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, and my shame is my dishonor. My foes are all before you. You see them. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, and there was none. For comforters, I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. And again, Christ on the cross. But David, having it happening to him here, let their own table before them become a snare. And this is what Paul is quoting in Romans. Let their table come for them a snare. You know, you preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And this is what he's done. He has given us a table. May it not become a snare to us. He's saying those who hate you because they're directing their anger and hatred toward the king of Israel, who is a very, a, an image of the Christ to come, they're hating. They're attacking. They want to do the devil's work and wipe out and destroy the Christ to come. Destroy the church. Let every good thing that they have be turned against them. Let their table become a snare. And when they are at peace, let that become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let, one who dwell, let no one dwell in their tents, for they persecute him whom you have struck down. And they recount the pain of those whom you have wounded. And to them punishment upon, add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no actual May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out from the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Woo! I mean, you know, that, that, this is like imprecatory psalms. What? Can we pray like that today? It's like, well, you can certainly feel like it. And if there are those who are enemies of the church, beware and know that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord God, I will repay. So, we pray that these guys would have their hearts changed, that we would not become like those people. But God, what Paul is saying is, God, this is being answered at the time when Israel is on a great path of rejecting their Messiah. And he's going to go on in chapter 11, and he's going to mess with our heads. And it's like, are you saying everybody's, all Jewish people are going to be saved? Apparently, there's going to be a great outpouring, and this hardening, partial hardening is going to be removed in some way. So you're going to at least see at some point, maybe close to the end of time, maybe not so close to the end of time, but at some point, the Jews are going to be majority, at least, Christian, to admit, I see. And you can say, well, you know, it's not good that God doesn't allow them to see. It's like, well, then God wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't good. There is a judgment that's being taking place for reasons and for purposes. And just to finish the psalm here, um, I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. For you who seek God, let your hearts revive. So this is what he's saying. They're enemies. But those who seek God, let your hearts revive. Know that God is on your side. For the Lord hears the needy. He does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah and people who dwell there and possess it. And the offspring of his servants shall inherit it. And those who love his name shall dwell in it. And so there's some objections. And you would hear it. Maybe like this, if God does not call me, I cannot come. You know, you start thinking about the sovereignty of God and the way there's judicial hardening and, and things like this. Um, someone could easily object and say, well, then if God doesn't call me, I can't come. And the answer to that is, God calls you even now, come. He calls, come. He holds his hands out to stubborn and obstinate people. 
He says, come. It's a real call. And he's saying, come. Come. If you think that um, you can do this on your own and your heart is drawing you to God, um, and then if somebody doesn't have the Holy Spirit at work, all this calling is just going to make a matter. Or they'll come for wrong reasons to a fake God that they've created in their own image. So you have to be careful of that. But coming to the gospel, anybody. He says, come. This is the call. This is, he wants this to go out. He's saying, come. I'm holding out my hands. And there's objection. Well, in God, unless God inwardly calls, as you say, I cannot come. And so the answer to this is, then the fault lies with you, not with God. It is not that you cannot come, but that you will not come. And then you have to be careful over the years. As time goes on, you get older, you've rejected, older, you stop listening, you're older, and you're complacent, and you're older, and time goes on, and you're older, and your back hurts, and your ear hurts, and you're tired of seeing everything change, you're just tired, and then the gospel call goes out, and Ecclesiastes says, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the later days come. Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon and he says, children, listen. Young people, listen. Because if you don't listen now and you reject now, when you get older, it is hard to change. And not just because we're stubborn, because we're stubborn, but because after a while, God will judiciously begin to give you ears that cannot hear and eyes that cannot see. If that is what you want, that is what you shall have. You continue to block out the word of the Lord. Eventually, be very afraid that perhaps the Lord will say, in here, I turn you over. So what we pray for is what we hear in John 6, 37, which is all that the Father gives to me, Jesus says, will come. And I will by no means cast out. So you can have the objections that say, I'm not chosen, I'm not elect, all this stuff, and the Spirit says come. Come and buy without cost. I, I give myself to you. All you have to do is believe and trust. In 1 John 3, 1, he says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are, as he writes to the church, the believing church. And so then we should strive to enter that rest, that we may with confidence draw near to a throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need and know, oh, how we need him. For if we do not understand how desperately we need Christ, and if we do not recognize the danger of subtle rejections on our part, then we're not going to be very zealous in prayer. We're not going to be very zealous in worship. We're not going to be very zealous in scripture reading. We're not going to be very zealous in the things of the Lord. We'll walk away from here unchanged. And that is not what the Holy Spirit has for us. As Paul himself says, God is holding out his arms. And we have but to answer and trust. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that you would give us more and more faith. We believe, oh, help our unbelief. Help us to, to know that you said that your voice is to go out into all the world. There are to be preachers who profess the gospel and that there will be those who will hear because faith does come by hearing and hearing through the word of Jesus Christ. So your word gives people ears to hear, eyes to see. Prophesying over dry bones. Can these bones live? Oh, Lord, you know. As the spirit goes out amongst the dead, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And you call those to yourself who are yours. We would pray that that number would be, would be we, we would see great numbers of people turning to you that it would be quite evident that whatever we would call it, that we see a, an awakening to your word, to your sovereignty, to your goodness, to the need of your people for you, or we are to be a people most pitied. Help us to cling to you in all things, and we pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen.